Welcome to the Fat Ice Race. If you enjoy this film, then please think about joining the Haggerty Drivers Club. You get a magazine that's award-winning and 24-7 roadside assistance, although I'm not sure it extends to Caterpillar tracks. Anyway, to discover all the benefits, just click on the link in the description down below. We're in Aspen, Colorado, the first time that the Fat Ice Race has been on this side of the Atlantic. But what is Fat International? Well, here's a man who can tell us, the mastermind behind the event, Ferdy Porsche. So Fat back in the days was a logistics company. And I think the guy was, like it stands for Francais Allemand Yeah. Um, it was between Germany and France. Yeah. But I think the guy was just the biggest motorsport guy. <laughs> because he sponsored everything from the Mar like all the cool Le Mans cars, like Saubers, Ferraris, and most famously two Le Mans winning Porsches in 94 and 97 and so he stopped doing his logistics company at one point um, and I think it has all the great heritage it's a bit like ice race you know like yeah. it's something that was there in the past and you can build upon it and it just has all the like aesthetics and it's just like representative of this great age of motorsport so, apart from lots of beautiful, bright primary colours contrasting against the snow, what is there at the Fat Ice Race? Well... We've got the paddock. There's a pit lane to which you're turning. The track. Oh, yeah! What else is there to do? Well, chill out. Soak up the vibes. Soak up the rays. Grab a drink. See some dogs. <laughs> you could purchase some merch. Everything from a scarf to a mug, or perhaps even a seasonal t-shirt. Perhaps most critically of all, we've got snow, which it's fair to say they've struggled with a bit in the European version over in Zalem Z. Plenty of it here though, which is perfect for this. This is ridiculous. So much fun though. Difficult corner, that big bank corner to get right. Love these S's down, this sort of back straight down here. All the blue paint, a bit like a sort of downhill ski run, I suppose. But you can link these turns super nicely. Wow, oh, this is good. They did a load of testing up in Michigan on the snow in this car. And they're pretty excited about it. They wanted it to be like Kind of you know four-wheel drive WRC car and so far it's pretty good so it should tip in on the brakes and the throttle as they say is your friend in this because that front axle will pull you out of slides the E-Ray has 655 brake horsepower from a combination of the 6.2 litre naturally aspirated V8 from the Stingray and a 160 brake horsepower electric motor in the front that spins up to 16,000 RPM. Because there's no conventional centre diff linking the front and rear axles, it means the all-wheel drive systems can do some very clever things when it comes to distributing the torque, making the E-Ray very playful if you want, particularly if you turn all the stability off. You can just feel that front axle being so helpful, but as you can see, you can still get big, big angles to drift around. Steering super smooth. I've got the heated seats and the heated steering wheel on at this as well. So I am a lot more comfortable than most people out here. Down with the brakes, round we go. Oh, this is pretty quick, I reckon, as well, actually. But before I knew it, the chequered flag was out and my three laps were done. There we go. First time in E-Ray, and uh, that seemed to go pretty well, I think. <laughs> Snow, of course, means 
no tires, no studs here in Aspen. We've got everything from this beautiful early 356 to, well, this. And we've got everything from this amazing Porsche 356 to, well, this Lucy-based Porsche, the half 11 from Oil Stain Lab with a V8 in the back. Sacre bleu. EVs are, of course, represented. Here's the Rivian, which is actually very quick out on track. The mighty Huna Pegasus was also in attendance. The Hot Wheels 914 Safari car was one of several with skis on top, and the WRC Escort won the award for most lights, although this genuine police mini had a light that stood out even more. We've got, um, well, more roofs than a dog show. Roof, roof, roof over there. I've even seen the man himself, Lois, hanging around in the snow. Undoubtedly, the most beautiful cars in the paddock are these three spiders. We've got an RS60 and then two 550s. They just look so dinky and beautiful and actually weirdly quite suited to the snow. And how should you drive on snow? What's the technique? Here to explain is the ever-eloquent Jeff Zvort. You know, probably the biggest thing about driving here in the snow is getting the car woed up for the corners enough that you aren't just pushing straight off. You want, you have to be very proactive in that. You need the plan, you need to get your braking done, you need the while the weight's on the nose, get the car to rotate. Then once the car is rotating, on throttle immediately. And I mean, I just described three sequences, but they all kind of happen instantaneously together. But there is that three part sequence to each thing. And I think getting cars slowed up, because you know, you, you saw a lot of cars that just kind of push off at the edges of the track. And, and I think, you know, being tidy right down to the blue lines, per, you know, nice car position. And as a driver, you feel it, you know, you turn it in and there's times where it pushes like a pig and you hate yourself. Then there's other times where just the rear starts coming out and you're on throttle and you just come around and you go, oh, that's so good. That's why I do this, you know, that's that kind of thing. And with those words of wisdom and enthusiasm ringing in my ears, it was my turn behind the wheel again. This time in something designed with a well-known ski holiday destination in mind. East Africa. This is super cool. This was done for the SEMA show. So it's a sort of working concept car. And it's a tribute and homage to the Datsun that took part in the East African Safari Rally. So it's on safari suspension. It's also got a bit more power, so probably 450, 470 brake horsepower compared to the 400 of the standard road car. Instantly, the balance in this is just lovely. Obviously, rear wheel drive feels absolutely made for it. <laughs> this is so much fun. Built by Tommy Pike Customs, it has custom 17 inch wheels and bespoke KW Safari suspension, which raises the ride height by two inches. Other tributes to that 240Z Safari car include the black bonnet and a smattering of additional LED lights. I really like the ones at the base of the A pillars. It's really nice and responsive on the brakes when you tip it in as well. Love it through these sections here, just linking these turns. Right, I think that is probably it. Nothing like a bit of front engine, rear wheel drive, on snow. <laughs> Wonder what we'll drive next. Here's hoping they put that suspension kit into production, a People's 911 Dakar or Hurricane Storato. Next up, it was time to have a look at something else with decent suspension travel, but this time sending over 600 brake horsepower to all four wheels. This is the actual Audi Sport Quattro S1 that tackled Pikes Peak in 1985. It has Michel Mouton's signature inside the door, but today it is Le Mans winner Dindo Capello driving it. It's the very first time for me driving this uh, legend because I was dreaming when I was uh, 20 years old that at one stage of my life I could have driven the, drive this car and uh, I, then uh, when I got the, the call from Audi Tradition to come here in Aspen driving this car I said no that is uh, really a dream come true and uh, but as you said the car is completely different to drive compared to the car I was using I was used to drive and uh, yeah I think I'm learning lap after lap and now I'm really enjoying to drive I I discovered some little tricks which make my life easier. At the beginning I was a little bit shocked about the behavior of the car, but then uh, I got some advice from uh, Timo, from Thomas, 
and uh, they told me how Stig or uh, Walter or Michel was driving the car and I tried to, to, so to learn a little bit using the left really a lot because you know the turbo lag is quite is huge therefore in such a slow track you have really to brake with the left go full throttle and wait until the turbo is coming and after that then it gets easier but the most difficult uh, moment uh, talking about uh, the, the, the most difficult maneuver is really to get the, the, the front turning in and uh, make the rear uh, and, and lose the rear. It's quite, it's quite difficult. Once the, rear, the rear it goes, then with the throttle and with the power of the car and with the great uh, quattro traction, uh, everything gets uh, get, uh, easier. As you can see, Dindo certainly seemed to be getting to grips with the quattro and enjoying himself, as did Tanner Faust, who was spectacular in a Mark 8 Golf R. Volkswagen had also bought a disguised Mark 8.5 Golf GTI for static display, and in the future I can certainly see the ice race expanding to become part motor show. In fact, one vehicle was making its world debut at the ice race this year, the Scarbo Performance SV Rover. The company has been behind wild things like the Huna Pegasus and a gorgeous road-going evocation of a 60s F1 car, but amazingly this 1100 brake horsepower road legal monster might just be Joe Scarbo's wildest creation yet. Original design was a Baja trophy truck design. Okay. And as King of the Hammers and Ultra 4 became a much bigger thing, the specifications for a desert race truck and an Ultra 4 truck, they started to merge. So tire diameters are roughly the same, wheelbase similar. Um, a lot of the Ultra 4 guys started going independent. A lot of the desert race guys started going four wheel drive. So this is a four wheel drive, four wheel independent, full tube chassis race truck that just so happens to be bodied as, this is a tribute to a Defender. Um, I was obsessed with Defenders um, when I was a kid. So yellow has always kind of been the color that yeah. I thought a Defender should be. Kind camel of trophy, camel trophy. Kind of, exactly, um, those original V8s that they did for, for them, the long wheelbase ones were so cool. Right? Yep, um, so that was kind of my inspiration for the body. I, uh, I'm obsessed with Land Rover, obsessed with Camel Trophy and it kind of overland adventure stuff. So um, that was the reason for choosing this body to go over the tube chassis race truck, essentially. The engine is a mid-mounted, supercharged 6.2 litre GM V8 mated to an 8-speed paddle shift automatic. There's four-wheel steering, and the air suspension has a whopping 30 inches of travel, giving rise to the SV Rover's party piece, independently articulated wheel arches. Next, it was time to watch a demonstration of something at the opposite end of the suspension scale. Yes, the Porsche Museum had brought over the very 911 GT1 that took victory at Le Mans in 1998. They took the push rods to the maximum to raise the ride height, wound the brake balance to the rear, bolted on a set of snow tyres and sent out one of the drivers that was behind the wheel in La Sarthe in 98, Stefan Ortelli. We pushed the car to the limit. She's, she knows how to dance on snow, I tell you. Uh, I was the first one to say, wow, it's going to be tricky, especially because of the steering uh, angle. You know, the steering rack is limited, of course, and you are very quick and on the lock point. You look through the window and there is nothing left, you know? so the only thing to avoid spinning the car is using the clutch. Yeah. Guess what? We are, we are happy. We still have the clutch back in the time in the 90s. So uh, I want to not only make a laugh about it, but I want to say that it was actually really uh, like a ballet. The car was really going from one side to the other, very smooth, capable to do it. The turbo was uh, helping me, but also the wastegate when you come off the car, you know it's the right time to bring the car on the other side. So everything was quite okay, I like, I like to say. Yeah. I loved it. Now for my final drive, and something with a bit more lock than the GT1. Because this classic Toyota truck belongs to pro drifter Ryan Turk. Here we go then. Wow, this is so fun! The 
we've got a six feet holland dresser question in this tons of fun oh. What a deadly bad thing that is. Wow, what a thing. That was um, a very quick two laps, but it's just insane. It's so loud in here and it stays so flat as well. You had to be so sort of positive to get it going. But once it's on lock, it just is awesome. What a fun little thing. It feels so small and dinky as well. And everything's just as you expect, it's proper competition spec. The throttle is so smooth, like the actual action of the pedal, so smooth. I love it, really love it. <laughs> Ryan, thank yes. you so much. <laughs> am, I, am I the only person other than you that's driven? You are, yeah. yeah. You, did, you did a phenomenal <laughs> job. <laughs> no, I really did, but, but it's back in one piece, which is it the is. Same thing. And I had some fun, we had some oversteer, so I'm very happy. <laughs> Talk through it, but how long did it take? It took um, just longer than we wanted it to, but it's about a year and a half project. Wow, because it's just, I mean, it's full custom chassis underneath it, isn't it? Which I love the fact you can see inside the door panels is going to still yep. be all yep. so in there, but it's, it's a proper bespoke full, thing. Yeah, full custom tube chassis. We had the option to, you know, obviously make it a lot wider. That's why we have the really cool over fenders on the front and rear that were all custom designed by a really good designer, John Sabal. And then a chassis was all designed by Kibbe Tech. And they did a great job. We kind of lengthened the wheelbase a little bit. Is that just to give it a bit more stability? A little bit more of, stability, yeah. and um, it just makes it a little bit better for drifting. Yeah, a phenomenal lock, obviously, on the, the front wheel. It's the first time I've ever driven a proper Yeah, you're like, oh, the you're wheel like, keeps just going. Just keep going. It's kind of like, where's this end? <laughs> it's, uh, no, it's so cool. And that rear suspension just all open up as well, that cantilever suspension. Yeah, yeah, that was what the designer's uh, idea at Kibbe Tech. And, He's like, dude, we got the truck bed is so open. Let's fill it with something really cool. And he's like, what do you think about cantilever suspension setup? And I was like, absolutely, let's do yeah. it. <laughs> and inside, I love the fact that obviously it's, it's old. You kind of you sit really upright. You got the screen really near you. Yep. So it's sort of old fashioned. But then you've got this amazing like Motec digital dash all across there as well. Yeah, John Reed who tuned who tuned it and uh, who, sorry, John Reed who tunes it. He made um, this really cool dash display that was based off of the old 66 Stout dash. So he like just built it electronically, and so it has a really cool layout on the screen. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's kind of trying to, it's all new stuff, but you know, trying to still bring some of the heritage back to the yeah. project. It's mega, I, I absolutely love it. It is such a fabulous mix of new and old, much like the entire paddock at the ice race, really. A plethora of fabulous, unlikely, historic, and yes, downright cool cars, wherever you looked, throughout the event, from the first skid to the final parade lap. So that's it. The first fat ice race in Aspen. Done. With a massive parade lap. And how to sum it up? Well, the one word I'd use is fun. It is fun. There's no point making out that it's any more serious than that and it'd be doing a disservice if you did fun is good and fun is what this is <laughs> <laughs>